uh, I was asked to talk about sculpture in uh, the collection. And I thought rather than sort of randomly saying, and here's another piece of sculpture, I better put some shape on it. So I picked uh, women, sculpture and women in uh, the Hugh Lane Gallery. And it's uh, active, inactive. I mean, some of you might be worrying about the inactive bit of it. It'll be mostly active, I can assure you, um, uh, women making sculpture. Um, but occasionally it'll be inactive in that it'll be women represented in sculpture and they may well be represented in an inactive way. So looking at both aspects of it, women making and women uh, represented in work. I think it's worth pointing out though at the start that uh, women beyond sculpture have had uh, a very important uh, place in the, in, in the Hugh Lane Gallery since its beginning. Um, I mean, Hugh Lane was very influenced by some of the women that surrounded him. And Ellen Duncan, his friend, was the first curator uh, of the collection. And that has continued over time. Now, it hasn't always been a woman, but there was Ethna Waldron, certainly along the way. And of course, we all know today that uh, Barbara Dawson uh, is the director of the collection. So the Hugh Lane can think of itself well ahead of the Louvre, because those of you who follow what's happening in the world of art will know that just, la just last month, actually, in May, uh, the Louvre appointed its first female uh, director uh, in its long history. So, um, and in Ireland, we have female director in Emma as well. I'm not going to go through the whole list of them, but uh, we have been fairly well advanced uh, in that aspect in, in the terms of the, the running of uh, the institutions. So we're going to look at, as I say, women making and women represented in, and just one other way in which uh, women were um, associated with sculpture. It's a very curious work to start with. Um, Henry Moore's reclining figure number two in the collection. All the works I'm going to show you are in the collection unless I indicate otherwise. Um, uh, so I haven't put in uh, that information on each of the slides. Henry Moore, uh, his reclining figures were mostly female. I mean, you'd look at them and you think, well, you know, which or what is it? And, and some of them are very androgynous. Um, some of them are definitely male, but most of them were uh, women, but they were always just simply called a uh, reclining figure. And when this was uh, offered to the Hugh Lane, when it was purchased by the Friends of the National Collection, um, in, uh, it was made in 1953, it was purchased by the Friends in 1954, there were, there were a lot of people involved in the controversy about whether or not it should come into the collection. I mean, whether or not it should come into Ireland effectively. Um, uh, and there were two women uh, on either, particularly on either side of the controversy. Um, a lady Beatrix Donnelly, who was a member of the Friends uh, at the time, was, I mean, aggressively vocal in her rejection of this work. And she wrote a letter to the Irish Times describing it as, you know, sort of an image of leprosy and cancer and uh, the horrors of it. And uh, it's the sort of thing you'd find in hell. Uh, and when she also said in, in that letter that you'd hear jazz in hell, it gives you some indication of where she was coming from. And um, so she was hugely, hugely opposed to it. Whereas Nora McGuinness, uh, the painter, um, was hugely supportive of it. Um, so there was this sort of for and against uh, the modernist work. And um, Nora McGuinness, she was president of the Living Art um, at the time. And she had very recently uh, represented Ireland at uh, the Venice Biennale. Uh, in fact, in the year that Ireland um, first participated uh, independently in, in uh, the Biennale. Um, so two women involved in um, the, the debate over a really important piece of artwork coming into the collection com and coming into what was effectively a collection of, and is, a collection of modern art. When the gallery was established, when it, when it first opened in its temporary premises in Harcourt Street in, in 1908, the sculpture collection looked something like this. It was much more of a painting collection, one has to say, uh, and um, the, 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 the key work was 
um, try and get my cursor working, uh, The Age of Bronze by, by Rodin. You can see it on the, on the cover of the catalogue as well, um, which Hugh Lane had, had bought from uh, Rodin. Um, there, there was no work, but this photograph was taken a few years after um, that first year in 1908, but it gives you an idea of the, the, the range of the collection. Uh, there was no work by women in the collection uh, at the start. The only way in which uh, women were represented in sculpture was in <laughs> their representation in a sculptural work. Um, the, and, and only in, in these, these two female torsi by Paul Bartlett, an American sculptor, uh, formed part of that opening uh, collection. Um, a seated um, a torso and uh, a standing torso uh, both worked in plaster. Yeah, Paul Bartlett, some of you may say, well, who's Paul Bartlett? Well, um, he was a really significant uh, American uh, sculptor um, uh, with a very um, important public career in public sculpture uh, in the US, uh, particularly in uh, Washington uh, and in New York, actually he's working in New York as well. But he was living in Paris mostly. And uh, at the time of the opening of the Hugh Lane Gallery, he had recently uh, finished an equestrian statue of General Lafayette for Paris, a, an important statue in a really important location in Paris. So this was a significant work. And he knew Hugh Lane and he knew about the opening that, you know, that, that he wanted to establish a modern gallery. And he offered Lane, and there are letters about all of this, uh, he offered Lane um, uh, a plaster version, um, uh, a smaller plaster version of uh, the Lafayette equestrian statue for his collection. But somewhere between that offer and what actually came, what was donated by uh, the sculptor, uh, there was a change of heart and these were the two works that came. Um, finished works in there, you may look at them and think, well, they're just fragments of something he was going to do. Uh, the notion of the fragment had become a finished work in its own right. So the fact that there are no heads and no uh, lower part of, of, of those limbs um, doesn't mean that they're unfinished. I mean, this is something that is really um, inspired by the work of Rodin and Bartlett in Paris, uh, knowing Rodin, uh, familiar with his work and very uh, influenced by it. So these are the first images of women in sculpture in the Hugh Lane collection. But work by women would come into the collection very, very quickly. I mean, just a couple of years later, uh, these two works joined um, the, I'm wondering why I can't see them properly because I'm wearing my glasses, excuse me. Um, these two works joined uh, the collection, uh, a work by Rosamond Prager, um, a, a sculptor who worked in, Bel in on the outskirts of Belfast, and uh, Theodora Glycan, a uh, work by her, uh, she was based uh, in, in London. And in fact, if we just look back at that, uh, and I only showed you some of that photograph before, uh, I cut off that bit uh, be, simply because, you know, these were there at the beginning and the waif wasn't, but the photograph, as I said, was taken later. There's the little waif uh, off to the left of uh, the photograph. Um, so two interesting that the two works by women are images of children, because this is, very much what women were expected to be doing if they were working in sculpture at the time, uh, depicting children, depicting things they were familiar with from the domestic environment, uh, doing other work as well, but, but particularly little ones and fairy tale uh, type imagery. And they're interesting, the contrast between them, because the Prager, the Prager which is bronze, um, uh, so the, the, the darkness of it makes the detail less, less clear, but it, it, it seems quite formal and, and it, it almost has a slightly medieval air about it in the way uh, she's costumed, the little one. Whereas uh, the lichen looks rather more uh, modern and, and more natural really uh, in sort of almost the absence of clothing in, in the way she's sort of pulling up whatever her garment is and, and even in uh, the haircut. So uh, something a little bit more uh, dated and something a little bit more modern in the way in which the children uh, are seen. Um, Glycan, her father was a sculptor, so she, she was brought up with it. Um, 
his father was actually a distant relation of Queen Victoria, and she ended up, up doing quite a bit of work for the royals uh, in London. Uh, Prager, as I said, um, in um, Hollywood in County Down near Belfast uh, was where she had her studio. And here you see her in her studio in the 1920s and, and you see more children um, and, and sort of fairy tale type imagery around. And that looks remarkably like the little waif there in, in the background. Now it's a bronze work, so there will be more than one of them um, uh, because this was already in the Hugh Lane in the 1920s. And interesting too that both of these sculptures, Gleich and, and Prager, they were both in touch with uh, Hugh Lane. Again, there are letters, um, Gleich and particularly in relation to paintings, not of her own, but paintings that he was interested in, in London. And Prager, um, who offered him a work actually for his new gallery, um, uh, she's, you know, something that uh, she was happy to give on loan or uh, to be, um, you know, permanently brought into the collection. And he went north to her studio to choose a work. Uh, so we, we can imagine him sort of walking around uh, in the studio and picking uh, the image of the little child uh, to be introduced into uh, his collection. And as I say, it was there very soon after, just a small number of years after, uh, the gallery actually opened. Now, women were also, I hate to say permitted, um, but you, th they were rather restricted really in what they, they weren't expected to be doing great monumental outdoor sculptural pieces. Uh, but sculpture certainly, yes, yeah, uh, sorry, portrait sculpture certainly, uh, yes. So there are portraits by women, um, uh, sculpted portraits in, in the collection. Uh, Mary Grant's um, bust of Parnell, and Mina Carney's bust of um, Jim Larkin. Again, a, a, an interesting difference between uh, the two of them because uh, the grant is, 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 is very sort of formal, quite sort of an official uh, portrait of, uh, of Parnell. Mary Grant's an English sculptor. Um, the, bust, the bust portrait was done uh, the year after uh, Parnell died and the original plaster model of this is in the National Portrait Gallery in London. So um, they have the work that's sort of directly from uh, her hand. Um, Mina Carney's Jim Larkin is interesting because it, it, it's, it's much more modern, obviously. Well, it's only a head to begin with, and it's much more modern in its modeling of the face, um, much less formal in its interpretation. And when, why was she doing uh, Jim Larkin? Well, Mina Car Carney, she was married to a man called Jack Carney. And Jack Carney had worked with Larkin here in Dublin. Uh, and then he had gone to the States and he had met her over there and married her and settled there. Um, and uh, it's, it's sort of interesting that she gets to do this because by 1935, um, Jim Larkin had been in the States and he'd been there for quite a long time but he was long back in Ireland by 1935 uh, and he was back sort of involved in the political scene uh, here in Dublin. Um, but she does the bust of, of uh, Larkin and uh, it makes its way to Ireland and it is given to the Hugh Lane, uh, it's presented uh, by the Workers' Union of Ireland just uh, two years later. Um, so, uh, Presumably, she met Larkin um, in the US and, and subsequently, um, it, when she was making this, uh, will likely have worked uh, from photographs. So women uh, depicting men uh, in portrait busts um, now, uh, women depicted in uh, the bus and one of them by uh, a woman. Uh, Melanie Lebrocki uh, depicting her mother, Sybil, in 1973, and Jacob Epstein doing a bust of Lady Gregory um, a lot earlier in, in 1910. I'm going to start with, with the later one, uh, the Melanie Lebrocki, because um, it's, a very, it's an interesting bust of, of um, Sybil Lebrocki in many ways. It's dated 1973. Sybil Lebrocki died in 1973. She died in 73 at the age of 81. And I'd be very interested to know if the bust was done before or after um, 
uh, Melanie's mother died. Uh, in other words, was she depicting her in her 81st year um, or was she doing something more commemorative of her, remembering her mother uh, after her mother had died? But interesting the way she captures the face of an older woman um, because she's done it by way of the modeling of the face rather than actually, you know, um, maybe putting a whole sort of series of wrinkles on the face. She's done it by this sort of almost blob like uh, technique where she'll have, she'll have done that on plaster or clay, whichever she was working on. Uh, and then that will have come out in the mold and be repeated uh, in the bronze. And that's what gives the aged effect to her face. And it's done in a, in a beautifully sensitive way. Um, and one feels a real sense of a knowledge of, of the woman. She looks quite stern in it. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I know she was um, a significant sort of literary person, um, but I don't know whether she was stern or not. But I mean, an interesting way of handling uh, the aged uh, depiction of somebody, um, uh, a portrait done at the age of, of 81. Jacob Epstein, on the other hand, much earlier, 1910, a uh, very uh, significant um, uh, modernist uh, sculptor, um, American English, I mean, worked most of the time uh, in London. And the Epstein portrait is interesting because we have, we have both sides of the story. We know very little about um, portrait sittings for uh, sculptural work. Um, the, the sculptors seem not to talk about it and the sitters seem not to talk about it. I mean, it's, it's as though what goes on uh, in the studio or wherever the sitting is taking place is completely private. Um, uh, in this instance, as I say, we have uh, both sides of it and, and they're fascinating and they reveal the way in which, go back to that for a moment, uh, active and inactive. I mean, they, the Larkin and the Parnell were, you know, pretty um, static uh, portraits. This has a very active surface. The textured surface of that is very active, but the face, face is absolutely still. There's a huge amount of movement uh, in this. Uh, Lady Gregory is definitely active. Um, and I think looks as if she's fairly ready to, I mean, that mouth looks just ready to speak and tell you exactly what she's thinking. Um, so, so what does the sculptor say about this? I'm just going to read you a paragraph because I think it's absolutely wonderful. It says so much about Lady Gregory. Uh, this is uh, Jacob Epstein's autobiography, which is titled, Let There Be Sculpture. And he said, the Lady Gregory was a commission from Sir Hugh Lane, and he intended it for the Dublin Art Gallery. The bust progressed to my own satisfaction, and it was about completed when one morning, Lady Gregory turned up with the most astonishing head of curls. She had been to the hairdresser and wished me to alter the head. I was not inclined to do this as the, the bust had up to then been planned to give Lady Gregory the air of the intellectual, somewhat schoolmarmish person that she was. And her usual appearance was all of a piece and quite dignified. Also, she announced that if I came to the theatre that evening, I would see her in evening clothes and would then see how much finer she appeared with bare shoulders. It's amazing, he says, or he writes, how English women of no uncertain age fancy themselves dressed as Venus. On both points, I told Lady Gregory that I could not imagine the bust any better if I altered it as she wished. And in my headstrong way, kept to my guns and this practically terminated the sittings. And he goes on then to say, you know, Hugh Lane was horrified by it and, and, and so on. Lady Gregory then um, uh, in her writings tells the story that she was going through these formal sittings and uh, on one occasion, uh, somebody came in to speak to her and um, the, the chat was about something that was going on in her precious Abbey Theatre. And she got completely caught up in the conversation and she forgot that she was sitting uh, for a portrait and that Epstein noticed this. Um, and I mean, she's recounting it afterwards, obviously, that he noticed this and he thought finally he had captured her in, in a totally natural state. 
And he, what she said he did was he chopped through the head at the neck and tilted it. Uh, and you can see that perfectly clearly. You can see the tilt in the head on both of these images, the way she's, it's tilting slightly to the side and looking slightly up. And you can sense, as I say, that she's, I'm sorry, that's hopping on me. Um, that someone, you know, we could be talking to her, somebody's talking to her and she, she's about to pontificate in some way. You can see that she's very much about to take over the conversation um, and that she's engaged in what she's doing, not engaged in just being aware of, uh, of the sculptor. So you also see in the work, which I think is fascinating as well, this great sort of join here, which is obviously where he cut through the head to tilt it. Uh, and without knowing that that's what happened, um, I think we can read that as though she was wearing a rather high sort of roll neck blouse rather than one with reveres, but something that came up to here, maybe unturned over. Um, and, and therefore sort of uh, stopping, uh, the clothing stopping there and then the head starting, rather than just seeing it as her being slightly, uh, as I say, guillotined almost uh, in, in the slicing through, but hugely active uh, in, in the way he's, he's caught uh, the woman. Now, we're going to see in, in, um, in sculpture in the 20th century in Ireland that um, marble and bronze, they won't disappear, they will continue to be used, but they will be challenged by new materials and new ways of making sculpture, and that this will be particularly obvious in the work of, of the women sculptors. Um, but I should also say that, you know, we shouldn't really call them sculptors, we should call them artists, because these are women. Dorothy Cross, I'm showing you a sculptural work by her, and I'm talking about sculptural work. Um, but she did a whole range of different types of work. So it's too restricting to call her a sculptor. And that applies to most of them that I'm going to talk about. So we think I'm talking about their sculpture, but we should think of them rather more uh, as artists. So as we will go on and look at new media, um, just to be aware that these artists who will work with, I mean, as I say, Dorothy Cross works with the most extraordinary range of, of, of different uh, types of materials. Um, she will also use the traditional uh, bronze. And here's a standing foxglove that she did. She did a whole series of these in uh, 2007. And I, I mean, it wouldn't be Dorothy Cross if it didn't have some sort of an edge to it. It's never just a foxglove. Um, and in fact, the way in which she has depicted this fox glove, some of those bell trumpets are actually uh, the tips of fingers. Um, and, and you'll all know from seeing them out in the countryside, I'm, I'm actually just back from Kilreelig. I was there last week. So walking along uh, the pathways uh, around the, the art center, um, the fox gloves uh, all along uh, the, the, the hedgerows, um, and, and they have this extraordinary sense of, they have this stately aura about them, and yet they're common because they're, they're everywhere, this strange combination. And they're, they're medicinal, they can help in various ways, and they can also poison you. So these, these contrasts that are there uh, in this extraordinary uh, flower. And one of the things we always want to do is kind of stick our finger up into one of those uh, trumpets. And what does she do? She turns some of the trumpets into. Uh, as I say, portions of finger, fing, fingers. The, the quote I love because I think, um, just particularly because of the times we've been, we've been going through, she said, from, this is 96, long before COVID, for me, art is an adventure that helps me cope with this ridiculous situation of being alive. I mean, how much has art helped us all cope uh, through um, these last um, months and years? Um, so, Let's look at some of the, the new materials and the new ways uh, of, of making sculpture and, and, and we'll see it in, in women and we'll see it in men when they're representing uh, uh, women. Um, a lecture of this nature, um, you're invited to talk about something sort of broadly in this way, it can give me the opportunity to select works that I'm particularly interested in are, um, that are that are among my favorites. And, and the two works on screen here are, are among my favorite works in, in, in Dublin. I think these are two astonishing uh, pieces of sculpture. Um, Kathy Prendergast, Waiting, uh, 1980. So a woman depicting women 
and Julian Opie's uh, Suzanne walking in a leather skirt. So a man uh, depicting uh, a woman. And they're both so incredibly different. Uh, what is it? There's 26 years between them. Um, the one um, very, very passive uh, and the other, um, well, one inactive, if you like, and the other uh, active. Uh, one very passive and the other very assertive. So completely different ways of, of looking at the woman and, and the way in which sculpture uh, feeds into that, we will see. Um, Kathy Prendergast um, uh, created this work waiting while she was still at art school. And she showed it in the Living Art exhibition that year and it won a prize and it was bought immediately uh, by the Hugh Lane. So uh, from art school straight into uh, the collection. And I've known it in the, well, I've known it since the living art, I suppose, uh, in that year. And it has, it has always stayed with me. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very strong, very interesting piece of sculpture per se. And, and it's a very strong work in terms of what it expresses. And while uh, Kathy Prendergast says it wasn't a feminist statement, uh, uh, should I think I was just curious about my mother's generation, um, it's difficult not to read it in feminist ways uh, today. And of course, the work stands independently and, and we read it in a sense in, in whatever way um, uh, it works for us. Um, but th the waiting is this, this series of women in ball dresses, in evening dress, um, sitting, waiting, um, presumably waiting to be at, at a ball or a dress dance of some sort, and they're waiting to be asked to dance. So waiting, um, do they see this as the beginning, waiting for their lives to begin, um, uh, waiting to be selected. And of course, the interesting thing about the selections where they have no heads. Um, so it's not about the head. It's not about what's going on in the head. It's not about the intellect. It's about how they look because uh, they will be chosen to be taken to the dance floor because of how they look. Um, so all of that uh, can be read into it. Now she had looked at photographs of uh, her, she said photographs in the fifties, um, her mother's generation, and they had uh, some, <clears throat> somehow uh, inspired the work. Um, I was looking for a detail of it, and and I was kindly. Um, sent this um, uh, from the gallery. It's, it's a, a laboratory shot, um, uh, conservation laboratory shot uh, of the work, but I wanted you to be able to see uh, the details so that you can see that actually she's using uh, textile. I mean, that, that that is textile that she'd use, which has a form of resin on it to make it stiff. And you can see the sort of frayed elements there of it around uh, the sleeves. And also you can see well, how very real it is uh, when you look at the arms and um, a, slight, a slight sort of Miss Haversham element about it as well, but also how insubstantial it is, you know, that th these are not full figures. There are no chairs. They are their own chairs. Um, you know, it, it, it's almost it's just the dress and, and the arms. And that's all that's present. The sewing patterns that you see there, they're on the, the back on the panel at the back. Um, um, lovely sort of flimsy tissue paper that sewing patterns were made of and apparently um, uh, Kathy Brendergast's mother did uh, an awful lot of sewing and you know they're on a parquet floor that is actually uh, a parquet floor and that's all part of the sculpture so completely different in 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 technique and materials and and everything about it in effect and this the, the the fragment in this case is very very different to the fragment that we saw in the Paul Bartlett uh, earlier on because this is sort of very much uh, reading into what she's actually depicting. Julie and Opie on the other hand so if they were sort of stationary and waiting and and, and no movement uh, this is all about movement and and if, if I was more tech savvy, I would be able to show you this moving. I'm sure you all know it. Um, it's such a stunning piece of sculpture, um, but I'm, I'm no good at that. So I'm just showing you uh, a still. Uh, and if anyone hasn't seen it, anyone out there, please, please, please go and, and, and look at it because you can see it 24 hours a day. Uh, Suzanne is there walking in her leather skirt and it, it's utterly mesmerizing and, and hypnotic. Um, and she's very statuesque uh, and very rhythmic uh, in her walk. And it's very, 
it's very she's very assertive but it's very calming actually that's not aggressive in any way um as i say full of rhythm and and lyricism and he's all about this and, and it's all about people walking julian opie this is on the listen gallery website a quote from says everything you can see is a trick of light light casting shadows creating depth shapes colors turn off the light and it's all gone um, turn, and we use vision as a means of survival and it's essential to take it for granted in order to function. Yeah, we, I mean, we just take it for granted that we can see things and move around. We, we can't look at, and observe everything, but then awareness allows us to look uh, at looking. And he's all about uh, looking. This work is not in the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, this is a work from 2019. He, he, he's looked at people walking in all sorts of different locations. And this is a group walking. Uh, in New York. It's not a moving piece like uh, the, uh, this is um, uh, um, a light box that animated, um, but the, these are stationary. But the sense of the different types of people walking in New, in New York, and that looks remarkably like uh, a nun among them, but as I say, not uh, in the Hugh Lane Gallery. Um, so we also have, um, uh, political work and, and women uh, involved in political work in, in the Hugh Lane, in political sculpture. Um, Rita Duffy, a woman doing political work, and Effie McWilliam, a man doing uh, a woman, uh, but which is a political piece. Um, both of these are Northern artists. Uh, Effie McWilliam is from Banbridge. I'm sure you all know the Effie McWilliam Gallery up there now. Um, he went to London around about the age of 18. And, and spent the rest of his life over there. But he, he did kept in touch with Ireland and certainly was affected by the troubles. There's no doubt about that, as we'll see. Uh, Rita Duffy, Belfast, um, uh, and, and, and very um, sort of involved with the whole um, um, story of the troubles uh, and, and uh, quite a bit of it in, in her work. Um, Effie McWilliam, his he did a whole series of women of Belfast and you have a bronze sculpture there and you have uh, two drawings there. So a lot of drawings, which are artworks in their own right, and a whole series of sculptures, probably about 25 or 30 of them and different sizes uh, as well. And they were done between 1972 and 1974. And they were particularly in response to the bombing of the Abercorn restaurant in Belfast in the, on the 4th of March, on Saturday, uh, important to say Saturday, the 4th of March, 1972, because Saturday afternoon it was packed. Uh, two women were killed and 130 people uh, were injured and no organisation uh, claimed responsibility, although it seems to be assumed um, that it was the IRA. Um, now, MacWilliam launches himself on this series of images, not to commemorate the two women who were killed, because he will go on to do a lot more of these. They'll mostly be called Women of Belfast. Some of them will be called Woman in Crossfire or Woman in, in a Bomb Blast, but mostly it's, it's that uh, title, Women of Belfast. So not to commemorate those two women, but to, to mark or commemorate all of the women who were affected by the troubles in the North in whatever way. Um, so they're not kind of mini monuments, um, they're, they're just ways of remembering. We look at them and uh, we remember. And they are women, uh, and it was two women who were killed on that occasion. And we know they're women because they're wearing skirts. Now, that, that's sort of curious in a sense, because we know that a lot of women wear trousers. Uh, but that wouldn't have worked for the sculpture. because So he needs the skirt to identify that it's a woman. Uh, and he needs the skirt as well for the sculpture, for the interest in sculptural form, because otherwise it would just be legs and arms shooting out, whereas the skirt gives it, uh, gives him a play of uh, sculptural form around the centre. Uh, and that's the case with, with all of them. Um, I think it's important to, to say in relation to these always that these were innocent bystanders and that's what he's depicting in the women of Belfast somebody who was you know taken off guard a bomb goes off and they're just thrown through the air the body is completely out of control it's just doing whatever the bomb sort of dictates uh, that it does so as I say the innocent bystander but we all know that women weren't all innocent bystanders uh, in the northern troubles that women 
uh, were very active uh, in, in a whole variety of different ways in, in what was going on in the North. So it's not, as I say, uh, the whole story, but they are hugely uh, expressive of uh, what did happen to innocent bystanders uh, during that period of time. So his work is from the beginning of the Troubles and um, the women. Rita Duffy's work, 1996, is from the other end uh, of the Troubles. And um, again, new materials, new media. Um, this is, a, I mean, it may look like something from a doll's house in reproduction, but it is a two-seater sofa. Um, so that's the scale of the work, big. Um, and we associate a sofa with, oh, comfort and security and snuggling up and, you know, you know everything about things that are relaxing. Uh, whereas this is absolutely the opposite. Her sofa has pins all over it. So what you think is a sort of a, a fluffy um, cover on the sofa that's all soft and cuddly. There are actually pins sticking out. So it's not a sofa that you want to sit on. And of course, the red, the blood red painted uh, and the pigment uh, blood red uh, on, the, on the object as well. So this was about, and she said it in 2017 and 2018, two quotes, to get up off the sofa to march is to get out of one's comfort zone. And again, in 1969, it was necessary for people to leave the comfort of a familiar sofa to go out and march for equality. So she was looking back at um, the whole, the significance of the civil rights marches and, and people getting up and getting out and doing what they had to do and not sort of hiding uh, um, in their domestic environment. So yeah, taking the sofa out of its domestic environment, environment and making it something uh, much more sort of hard hitting. I, I looked also in there for abstract, uh, abstract sculpture by women, and, and there is, but I chose this, which isn't entirely abstract, very contradictory, but I really wanted to include Gerda Frommel, um, uh, her animal and fish hunter. Uh, Gerda Frommel was um, a sculptor who came to us from what's now the Czech Republic. Um, she came here in 1956 to Dublin. Um, and she died sadly very young. She died at the age of 45 in, a, in a, um, a drowning accident in 1976. But in that short period of time, she produced really, really important work. And I, this I picked because I think it's so interesting. Um, it's bronze, but I'm sure like me, when you look at it, you think it looks like stone. Um, and she started the work with stone. So she gets a, a, a sort of a large, a uh, flat piece of stone she finds, which has already been sculpted by the weather, in effect. And she makes small incisions on it. And um, these are like uh, early cave paintings, in effect. You can barely make them out and they're, very, they're quite difficult to read. Um, the shape, I always think, you know, the little bit of work here and the eye looks a little bit like a fish. Um, so she makes these markings and then she casts it in bronze. So she transfers it to a different material and it's two sided. Obviously, you can see from the way um, it's standing, there's work on the other side of it as well. So to all intents and purposes, when we look at it, it's abstract. And then when we hone in on it a little bit more, we find actually that there is more going on. And I think that duality um, the hovering between figures of an abstract uh, makes it very particularly important. Uh, other animals in the collection are birds by women. Um, Elizabeth Frink's uh, Warrior Cock, 1957, and Nikki de saint Big Bird of 1982. Um, when we think of birds, just look at them separately for a moment. Um, I think of flight and freedom and independence and escape and all of that sort of thing. Whereas um, I think Elizabeth Frink's are, are much more sinister, actually, her birds um, and, and much more grounded somehow uh, and very different to what Nikki de saint Fal was doing. I mean, they, they, were, uh, they were born in the same year and Nikki de saint Fal and Elizabeth Frink, but their, their work is so very different. And of course, Frink is using traditional materials and, and uh, saint Fal, as we'll see, is not. Um, Frink was, was um, depicting birds when she was still a student. This is a comment on her work when she was a student in 1949. 
uh, with uh, it being said of her, of her drawings then, her drawings of crows, hawks or eagles, predatory and menacing and full of a sculpture's three-dimensional form with their steely talons. And Elizabeth Frink, an undated quote, uh, also saying of them in their emphasis on beak, claws and wings, they were really vehicles for strong feelings of panic, tension, aggression and predatoriness. Uh, and in fact, she begins working on them just after the Second World War and, and sort of warrior cock and, and, and the sort of fighter element, um, military um, air power uh, was part of the influence in uh, what she was doing. Whereas Nikki de Saint Fal seems to be much more about uh, freedom. When this came into the collection, this is dated 1982, um, and uh, I remember when it first came into the Hugh Lane, it, it seemed to be, well, initially I think people were shocked by the colour because people were still thinking of sculpture as bronze, brown, or white uh, marble, um, and you know, that had never been colored. Whereas, you know, as we know in, an, in antiquity, sculpture was richly colored. It just lost its color over time. Um, so it's just reintroducing something that had been lost. So once they acclimatized to color, it was as though, yes, when it was colored, it couldn't be sculpture almost, it should have been painting. But once people acclimatized to the color in sculpture, I think this became at the time, I don't know if it still is one of the hugely popular ones, but then it was really probably the most popular uh, work in the collection because of this burst of colour uh, when you walked in. And she's also somebody who birds have been a constant, just like Frank, um, uh, a constant theme in her work, immortal birds, sad birds, triumphant birds, the hungry bird. Uh, birds are messengers from our world to the next. And my guardian angel, she says, is a bird. Um, and just because Isabel Nolan is a, they were sort of uh, English and French, this is an Irish artist, Isabel Nolan, and I'm not suggesting this is a bird or necessarily flight, but her rings of Saturn, which is, you know, about uh, the great world out there. Um, uh, there's a, a lot going on in terms of um, the different materials used, but there's also this sense of orbiting hovering over it. This is actually hanging on a very thin wire, hovering above the rings of Saturn there. And I included this because of sort of relationship with flight um, uh, and, and movement and the sculptural element, but also because just to tantalize you, uh, Isabel Nolan also did this work out in Dublin airport. And I think you could probably see the beginnings of it there in uh, the rings of Saturn in, in the Hugh Lane. And I think that's probably where we all want to be now is coming and going at that turning point uh, out in the airport, but hopefully before too long. So just to finish up, um, uh, installation and environments. Uh, Deborah Brown, a Belfast sculptor, um, uh, doing very much um, an installation work. And Dorothy Cross's shark lady in a ball dress, which formed part of a loose installation in the Douglas Hyde in 1988. Um, we met Dorothy Cross during the Fox Club earlier on. Uh, the, the, the group show of work here was called Ebb. Um, and, but while, while these are works that stay together, this is the whole work. These all got broken up eventually. And this particular one, uh, the shark lady in a ball dress is in the Hugh Lane. Um, this two behind. I don't know where the other groups went. That was called Mr. and Mrs. Holy Joe. This is all about sex and sexual activity. And I think that's a marriage veil that's hanging uh, between them. Um, so Deborah Brown's environment, as I say, this is all of a piece. Um, these people waiting for a Punch and Judy show. Uh, she'd been working on stage sets for the Lyric Theatre in Belfast in the 50s, a Belfast artist and um, she'd been making them in paper and wire and she went on then to make these sculptures out of the same material. So there's a fragility about them, certainly. Um, but the waiting aspect, um, you know, we'd waiting, women waiting to be asked to dance and first in the early work we looked at there, also uh, from the 80s. Uh, in this instance, they're waiting for the Punch and Judio. So this person clearly fallen asleep. These two are having a little chat here. This person sitting reading, waiting for, and this was the person presumably collecting the tickets at the side. And we we sort of walk through and examine and explore. And then we look around, we turn around and we, we wait ourselves for uh, the event to begin. So we become part of 
the artwork. The shark in a ball dress, a whole other ball game going on here um, because this is, um, we're back to the ball dress, which is quite interesting. Um, and Dorothy Cross says it's meant to be slightly mad, the frivolous aspect of the ball dress and the danger of the shark at once male and female, the ball dress, um, um, it, it bronze, woven bronze mesh um, and cast from her grandmother's ball dress, I gather. Um, the, the sort of body part up at the top actually is a penis, believe it or not, and a fin sticking out behind. So she's mixing the genders uh, in her work. Um, and, and it's very interesting uh, in, in relation to um, uh, where we started because um, the genders are, are, make, are fused, if you like, in, in, in this figure, in, in, in the Dorothy Cross um, um, uh, image. Whereas here, they're separate, uh, intended to be fused eventually, but, but the male is understood uh, in the image that the, the men, as I say, will be coming to invite uh, the waiting women uh, to participate in, in, in the dance. Um, and just, I mean, I'm, I'm at the end of the images that I want to show you, but it's fascinating that two really significant works actually that are in the collection uh, done by women, both um, uh, containing ball dresses um, and both uh, containing um, the, the image of the fabric uh, of the ball dress and both looking at the use of it um, in a completely uh, different way because I mean, there, there the ball dress has been used to feminize the male aggression. Um, and here, goodness, um, yeah, as I say, the relationship, it hasn't yet started, um, but is expected or uh, anticipated. So remember the ball dresses. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>